Hello and welcome to another edition of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam. Of course, this program is brought to you in conjunction with a collaboration put together by uh, Ramsey Saim Darby Healthcare and also Farm and Yaga coming together to give you as much information as we can and to try to simplify all that jargon that's flying around in the medical world. And when you talk about the medical world, we're always a part of the medical world because we always seek medical advice or medical attention. That aside, in our show today or on the show today, we'll be talking about neurosurgery and what that means. We'll also be uh, looking at some uh, very funny um, words like oculoplastics. Do you know what that is? If you don't stay with us, we'll be giving you the 411 on that as we move along on today's edition of Medical Today. But as usual, in our first segment, we're always joined by someone in Pharma Nyaga. And to join us once again on the show is Vanessa Daniel, the Deputy General Manager for Clinical Affairs. She's also a pharmacist, a pharmacologist, and she's from Pharma Nyaga Brahad, joining us today to talk about pharmacovigilance. That's pharmacovigilance. What's that mean? Hi, uh, Vanessa, thank you very much for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to have you here once again. The last time you were here, we were talking about medications, but uh, the last time around was about safety of medications, something to that effect, right? Mm. Cosmetics. Cosmetics, yeah. Safety uh, so cosmetics. safety yeah. with uh, cosmetics and uh, also uh, some, some cosmetics uh, kind of cross into medications. Am, am I right? Am I not right here? Okay, so safety of drugs and safety of cosmetics, both are important mm -hmm. to the uh, users, but how they are managed, slightly different. Right. Okay. So the management of it is slightly different. So when we uh, move into today's topic, pharmacovigilance, what's, uh, what's that mean? You know, to simplify this, okay. being vigilant about uh, stuff from the pharmacy. Okay, that's a big word, pharmacovigilance. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, to make it really simple, uh, it basically means drug safety. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we do in drug safety? What's it about? So drug safety is uh, really everybody's responsibility. We have patients, we have uh, doctors, we have... Uh, the government, we have drug manufacturers all working together to collect information, to review this information and then spread awareness about the side effects of drugs and how to best manage it and to not be so afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Now, in Malaysia, when you talk about uh, statistics or collating information, mm. um, how do we do it in Malaysia? Do we have a different way of doing it as it's done overseas, say in the Western world or in other Asian countries? Okay, so we have a, a huge database of uh, drug safety information being collected uh, from every country and uh, they have a monitoring centre where they uh, look at all this drug safety information, uh, they analyse it and determine whether this is real information and uh, good enough or not, uh, not good enough, important enough to be, uh, to be spread, to, for the awareness to be spread mm -hmm. to health practitioners and also patients. So yes, uh, to answer your question, yes, there is a global database for this. Right. So when we look at drugs, like you said, cosmetics and drugs, the way it's, you deal with it is different. Mm -hmm. uh, even with drugs, there's uh, prescription drugs, there's over-the-counter drugs. Yeah. Any difference with these uh, the, the two uh, branches of drugs? Okay. Um, over-the-counter drugs, are, you know, you don't need a prescription to buy them. You can just go to your pharmacist, buy the drugs. Uh, prescription drugs, you need a doctor to <coughs> prescribe it to you. Uh, but both have drug safety uh, awarenesses that we need to spread. Okay. Uh, both need, both have side effects. There's no such thing as, oh, it's an over-the-counter drug. There's not mm -hmm. going to be any mm -hmm. side effects. There will be. Right. Okay. Uh, when you talk about side effects over-the-counter, let's take paracetamol, for instance. Okay. There's so many myths flying out there as to how bad it is for your kidneys, so on and so forth. I'm sure you you heard this. So yeah. there must be some form of uh, control with regards to okay. even over-the-counter drugs in it. Yes. 
So um, we can't control what goes about virally on the mm -hmm. internet mm -hmm. or through WhatsApp messages. Okay, but uh, what I would do if I was a patient or a dr uh, of a or a paracetamol user would be to first read the package insert. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go to pharmacies and buy uh, those nicely packaged, hang on, we know package inserts as paper. Okay. In the dustbin. Yes, that's yeah. right. So you go to the pharmacy, you buy those nice beautiful boxes, you, you, you open up, you mm -hmm. get this nice little piece of paper which you conveniently okay. dispose. You don't even read it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you know, that, that piece of information, that piece of paper has so much information that you can use, okay, mainly on the side effects. So let's say that piece of paper has got 70 side effects listed. It doesn't mean you're going to get all those 70 right. side effects. You may get one. Mm -hmm. You may not even get one. But the important thing is that you read it and you are able to identify if you do get one, what are you supposed to do? Do you panic? Mm -hmm. uh, well, obviously not. You shouldn't panic. Right. But at least you know that, okay, this is a side effect. I need to see my doctor or uh, you know what to do once you have it. Right. Now, with side effects of medication, mm. uh, when you see a doctor, okay, um, he gives you three or four different pills, even if it's for, say, a simple cold and a fever. Yeah. Right. Do you need an explanation as to how each and every one works? Ooh. I mean, we go to our doctors, we take it for granted. They give us medication, we take it, we go home. We're talking yeah. about uh, going to your normal clinics uh, around your uh, right. housing areas or your, your primary, what do you call it, care, healthcare provider yeah. to get what you need when yeah. you're not well. But, and we take it for granted that you know, whatever they're giving us, all we need to do is just take it yeah. as requested without understanding, uh, getting yeah. more under understanding about it. Is it being too pernickety if we want to know more about these? No, of no? course not, no. because you're, you're the patient. You know, I would think that uh, it's really important for you to educate yourself on what you're taking. Uh, responsibility also lies with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, uh, we don't always stick to one doctor's. We always go to clinic A, B, C in the span of six right. months. Okay, uh, uh, what doctor shopping? Yeah, something like that. I love that. Okay, yeah. and um, you know, these doctors probably don't have your medical records mm -hmm. for the last three months. Right. Okay, so uh, what I would do would be to make sure when I visit a doctor to uh, make a list of the medications I've taken for the last three months. Uh, let your doctor know so he knows that when he prescribes a medicine for you, he knows what you've been on and what you are on. This is especially important for those of them who are on long-term medications like right. diabetic medications, hypertension medications. You want to tell your doctor, you know what doc, I'm on these medications. Um, do you think what you're prescribing for me could give me a side effect because I'm on other medications? Mm -hmm. It's important to tell your doctor that. Right. Uh, now. Uh, for those of us who are wondering what's happening with regards to different doctors, say someone was to give you a, a simple example, some of us work within the city but we live outside the city. So where we live naturally, there'll be a healthcare provider of some sort that we go to. Sure. Now where we work at uh, in the city, if you're not well, you're going to go to one of the uh, doctors around you or panel clinic. Mm -hmm. And it's always good to give them information as to what you're Absolutely, taking. Absolutely, yes. Right, right. It's always important to uh, let your doctor know information that he may not have about you. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. This is to help him treat you in the best possible way. Of the areas we were talking about this and you did talk about listing down your medication. Uh, not many of us do that, have a list of the, the medications right. we take. Of so course. when we list, uh, uh, put a list of medications we are on, uh, when, we when, when we talk about these medications or when we uh, put it down to uh, as information for a doctor, what do we need to put down in there? Because there's a brand name and there's also the generic brand name sometimes. What do we need to put in there? I think uh, if you, uh, for a lay person, uh, if you're not used to uh, looking at the at a active ingredient of a drug, and these, these kind of words may be a little bit uh, daunting for somebody to write down. Sometimes you don't even know how to spell the drug properly. Just get the name, any name, you mm -hmm. know, either the label name, the brand name, the active name, anything. I think the doctor is trained enough, he will know. Right. Now taking medication, there's take before, after and with meals. Can you explain <laughs> yes. this to us? Okay. Uh, I, I get lost when you say with meals. I with don't quite meals. understand yet. Okay. So you can take a, a, a medicine before meal or after your meal. Okay. okay? Uh, some drugs uh, actually work better uh, 
uh, without the presence of food, they get absorbed better, they, get, they, they uh, affect your body a lot better. Some drugs uh, work better when they are taken with food. So it really depends. Again, this is where you need to look at your label or the leaflet, the package insert. It will tell you whether to take before food or after food. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, let's say for some people, they may have problems like gastritis. Right. And uh, for these kind of people, maybe the situation is you can't take drugs and on empty stomach. Could be your health condition. This you can speak to your doctor and say, you know what, doctor, I have this condition. Can I actually take this drug before food? Is that a problem for me? He'll find a way to you know, change mm -hmm. the dose for you. We've got about 40 seconds left. Mm. Very quickly, this 10 sure. minutes is gone. Uh, what's your advice on side effects with medication? Okay, I think uh, besides listening to your doctor, don't mix medications, don't self-medicate. Okay, that's right. wrong. That's really wrong. Why, why are you smiling when you say this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one. Number two, uh, ask your doctor if you need to make lifestyle changes. You know, some medications can actually, uh, some uh, foods can cause your medicines to not work, like grapefruit. Mm -hmm. Okay, or you may experience uh, um, sensitivity to sunlight uh, if you take certain types of medications. Do you need to stay off the sun? You could experience weight gain or weight loss, maybe change your exercise regime. You know, there are a lot of things that you can uh, change, that, that you can do uh, to your lifestyle to reduce the occurrence of side effects. Ask right. your doctor. Right. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank uh, Vanessa for coming in. Uh, Vanessa Daniel, the Deputy General Manager for Clinical Affairs slash Pharmacologist for Pharma Nyagabura, joining us to talk about pharmacovigilance. Stay with us. We'll be back after a short break right here on Medical Today, Benama News Channel. அரசியல் பொருளாதாரம் சமூகவியல் அறிவியல் விளையாட்டு கலை இலக்கியம் அனைத்துலக செய்தி என உடனுக்குடன் தகவல்களை கொண்டு வருகிறோம் புதிய பொழிவோடு புதிய நம்பிக்கையோடு பர்னாமா தமிழ் செய்திகள் பர்னாமா அலைவரிசையில் மட்டுமே The Nation, a talk show from the Current Affairs Desk with in-depth conversations on health, women, property, culture and performing arts. Only on the Nama News Channel. Hello, Malaysia, and welcome back to Medical Today. 
As promised, we're going to find out what neurosurgery is all about. Uh, to talk about neurosurgical conditions or problems, we have with us two very experienced doctors, Dr. Dr. Azmin Kas Rosman, a consultant a neurosurgeon from Ramsey Syme Derby Healthcare, and also Dr. Liu Bun Singh, who's a consultant neurosurgeon also from Ramsey Syme Derby Healthcare, joining us on Medical Today. I'm honored to be here by two, uh, to be uh, joined by two neurosurgeons. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming in. Now, I guess the most simplest and the basic of questions for people like us, us lay people, is what is neurosurgery? Maybe, uh, Dr. Asmin, you can start with your take on what uh, neurosurgery is. Thank you, Gerard, for the invitation and the opportunity to explain about something about neurosurgery. Uh, neurosurgery is a discipline within uh, medicine and it entails uh, the treatment, the diagnosis and the treatment of uh, neurosurgical problems uh, of the patient. Mm -hmm. So what we do is for the patient, we diagnose what the, if the patient has based on the signs and symptoms of the patient and then we do the investigations of the patient and based on the investigation of the patient, we would do the appropriate treatment, mm -hmm. whether it's medical treatment or surgical treatment. Right. Uh, because we have two of you here who are neurosurgeons today, I think the, the better question to find out is why did you take up this area of specialty? Maybe, uh, Doc, you can uh, uh, walk us through that. Why you picked up uh, neurosurgery as your area of speciality? Yeah. Uh, uh, at first, uh, neurosurgery uh, is uh, uh, quite interesting uh, because it treats uh, the system that uh, uh, involves the whole body mm -hmm. system. Uh, is not specific to certain region of body and uh, we could actually uh, put them either uh, in the brain or spine or even in any nerve in the body where we call them as a peripheral nerve right. and this nerve is some form of transmitting some electrical activities which control the system of the body uh, uh, in terms of Im immunity of the body, the function of body, both uh, uh, motor function, the movement, mm -hmm. the sense, the sensory, and mm -hmm. also the organ function of the whole body, including the heart. Mm -hmm. so now, now, I think, uh, coming back to you, Dr. Azmin, I think this makes it that more complicated because it involves the whole body. Now, um, is neurosurgery confined to any specific body part when you talk about body parts? Well, the, the most um, the important part the, of the central nervous system is the brain and you have the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, the, the nervous system consists so the of the central... Central nervous yes. system and the peripheral, yes. peripheral nervous which system. Which is the brain. This mm -hmm. is, if you can see this is the brain. And then you have the spinal cord which runs from the brain right down to, 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 the, to the back of, right. of, the, right. of the patient. Okay, so this is the spinal yes. cord. Mm -hmm. So this is the spinal cord, and this is where the head is. Right. And you have the spinal cord, this yellow part of, of, the, um, of the structure, which runs down right down to the back. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the peripheral nervous system, which are the fine nerves all around the body. body. And you have also autonomic nervous system. Uh, these are the, the, the nervous system which controls the heart and the, the, the ab abdomen and the gut. But essentially, most of, most of the time, the neurosurgeons are concerned with the central nervous, the brain mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the spinal cord. Right. But uh, when you talk about neurosurgery, is neurosurgery uh, limited to any specific group age? Now, I will move to you, Dr. Liu. Yeah, uh, neurosurgeon, uh, we do treat uh, patients uh, of all ages uh, from the time they're even in the in in intrauterine uh, period uh, before their birth uh, up to the person who are at their golden ages. And the treatment uh, depending on uh, diseases. Uh, at different ages, a patient would uh, present it to a neurosurgeon uh, with different spectrum of diseases and disorder. And uh, they usually need a specific investigation and specific uh, treatment, uh, I mean surgical treatment uh, according to their age and the diseases right. that they're presenting at. So it'll be very interesting to now find out how a patient or someone who needs neurosurgery comes to you by, uh, by means of coming through their primary health care. Uh, what can happen with a the, with the person uh, at a, healthcare, a primary health care level where it's ascertained by uh, their uh, primary uh, physicians 
that they need to see a specialist and then a neurosurgeon? Uh, uh, what, what kind of diseases do you treat, basically? Um, because neurosurgery uh, can involve uh, from a newborn right to the golden age of a, of, of a particular patient, um, it happens even during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. During pregnancy, if the mother, for example, has, has, has noted to have an, a very enlarged abdomen um, due to the pregnancy, then uh, they should investigate, do an investigation why the, why the girth is, is bigger. So sometimes uh, certain conditions of the, the brain or the spinal cord can give rise to such a condition for the mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and an appropriate uh, investigation, like an ultrasound, um, has to be done and a consultation with the neurosurgeon should be done. And normally, if we find that the head is too big um, for, uh, for the child to be delivered, normally by spontaneous vaginal de delivery, then the child has to be delivered by cesarean. Normally, in such cases, um, patients normally have um, problems with their spinal cord or their brain. And this uh, may be due to multifactorial causes, could be genetic causes, especially if uh, one of the families have a, 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 such a sim uh, problem as this. And sometimes it's also due to the food uh, diet in the, in for, the, for the mother. Mm -hmm. Dr. Liu, would you like to add to this? Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, diseases or disorders that affects uh, uh, pregnant women or, or newborn babies. Yeah, uh, uh, the most uh, common presentation to a neurosurgeon in a newborn baby is a big head, uh, wh where we term in medical term as a hydrocephalus. Uh, it simply means there's an excessive accumulation of uh, brain water or, or cerebral spinal fluid within the head of the patient. Again, as what has uh, been explained by uh, Dr. Azmin, mm -hmm. uh, is usually due to the structural abnormalities uh, during the pregnancy itself. And a lot of time, uh, people have related it to a low uh, folic acid in the diet, mm -hmm. uh, which usually affecting uh, in a low income and so medium income. By and large, this is when a neurosurgeon steps in to, yes. to solve the problem out. Now, when we talk about children or, or newborns, let's talk about uh, kids who are a little bigger, let's talk about teenagers and young adults. What kind of diseases uh, afflict them? Yeah, unfortun unfortunately, in Malaysia, most of the teenagers and the young adults have, uh, are involved in motor vehicle um, road traffic accidents. So, so they have a lot of trauma cases. We have, we have uh, an abundance of trauma uh, and they come with a severe head injury and the severe head injury uh, takes a long time to recover. I mean, you, have an ex you can have an accident, an accident can happen within a split of a second, but it takes months and years to that recover. That includes sports injuries too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So normally, in such a patient, so there's had the patient, when the patient comes in into the hospital, there's, they have to undergo sometimes, depending on the investigation, they have a huge clot in their brain which has to be removed and the brain, the brain will not be able to uh, return to its uh, normal self within a short time and it takes months or may, it may never come back to its normal self. So mm -hmm. sometimes the patient will have severe weakness, uh, severe dis uh, weakness of the, the, the legs yeah. and the hands mm -hmm. and inability to talk and the patient will be on sometimes they have to open up the throat. So I think prevention is very important. I mean everybody Trauma is, 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 a, a significant, is a very, very serious in, in Malaysia, mm -hmm. road traffic accidents, and I think everybody has to be careful in, in, the, in their lifestyle. Right, Dr. Lee, when you, when you talk about trauma, when you, talk, when you, when you see a, a patient with uh, internal bleeding uh, within the brain, can you sort of tell if the patient's going to pull through and, and uh, brain activity is going to come back to normal? Can it be told in the early stages? Yeah, definitely yes. Uh, and uh, most important uh, for those patients with acute trauma, the, the investigation that carry out should be immediate, uh, where we term them as golden hours. Uh, the earlier diagnosis was made, uh, and the earliest uh, uh, assessment can be made to a particular patient, 
and that, that will help us in terms of uh, accelerate the surgical treatment. Uh, those patients who need a, a surgical treatment are usually, we can see uh, from the conscious level, uh, usually they are in a poorer conscious level or in a severe form of injury. Uh, Sometimes they may have uh, some uh, neurological sign that can be de detected, for example, unequal uh, pupil size and or abnormal movement of the limb. Uh, those are important signs we look at and we, we need to correlate those findings with imaging findings and to tell us what form of uh, surgical treatment may be indicated in those cases. Right, so ascertaining and uh, looking at treatment options all comes in the golden hours, yeah? uh, yes. the, the first few hours after trauma. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll take a short break and we'll come back. When we come back, these two gentlemen are going to walk us through a little bit more of neurosurgery right here on Medical Days. Stay with us. Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders at 8.30 p.m. Monday, only on BNC. Nine Eleven menampilkan pelbagai segmen menarik khas buat anda. Saksikan Nine Eleven setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat 9 pagi hanya di Bernama News Channel. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. We're currently discussing neurosurgery or getting a simple understanding of what neurosurgery is. I'm joined by the men in black. No, I'm joined by two very uh, established doctors, Dr. Dr. Azmin Kas Rosman, a consultant neurosurgeon. Also joining us is Dr. Liu Bun Singh, who is a consultant neurosurgeon, both from Ramsey, Saim Darby Healthcare. Now, we're talking about uh, problems with regards to accidents, trauma to the head. Uh, this always happens with sports people. Just uh, the bad driving and riding we do in Malaysia also accounts for a lot of that. Uh, when it comes to adults, there's an added component to it. As you were talking uh, to me or, or giving me some information off the airwaves, you were saying that I know adults have an added, added uh, what do you call it, uh, trauma, which is psychological trauma. Can you walk us through this? Um, especially in Malaysia, and the, the people who are riding motorcycles, they are very young age group, the teenagers, and also the, mm -hmm. and sometimes they could, could be the family breadwinner. So if they are involved in an accident, they, uh, they are unable to, um, to, to provide for the family, and the family is an immediate stress on the immediate family and the relatives. Right. And on, on top of that, your, the company is also affected, and uh, for the, and the government is also affected because for, ev for treatment for a patient with severe head injury, mm -hmm. it would amount to about 30,000 to 100,000. Right. That's in, in 30,000 to 100,000, that's in public health care. Uh, yes, yes. Public and private both. So uh, uh, that, yes. that, that's a, lo a lot of money. Now, I, I guess the bulk of your work is explaining to families before you carry out a surgery, you need to explain to families what's going to happen. And of course, you know, when, it, when, it, when you're dealing with a brain, uh, it, it, it's, it's added stress to a family. Now, um, when, when you talk to families, um, you know you've got a bad case 
at hand or on hand and you need to do something about it, but the risk, there's a 50-50 risk. Uh, how do you explain this to families? Yeah, this is quite uh, difficult, especially at the beginning of my career as a neurosurgeon. But over the time, uh, we must uh, to be able to convince the family a surgical is a must in certain cases. Uh, some cases we may need inform uh, some form of uh, monitoring in uh, those patients. But the understanding about the injury, especially the primary injury, which happened during the accident itself, is very important. And what we are doing now at the second stage, we call it a, a prevention of secondary brain injury mm -hmm. uh, in the form of a, a surgical by evacuating uh, evacuation of a blood clot in, in, the, in the spine or in the cranial, right. intracranial component, uh, optimize uh, oxygenation, ventilation of patient to prevent secondary injury. And definitely at time of injury, it's very hard for us uh, to prognosticate. Uh, whether a patient will recover from it. But based on our observation, usually young patients, we tend to do better uh, than elderly. Uh, having said that, uh, in trauma, there's no age uh, limitation in terms of treatment. But of course, you know, in younger people, it's easier because recuperation is better and faster. Yes, so you see results a little faster. Now, uh, when you talk about uh, work uh, done by a neurosurgeon, the scope of work uh, by a neurosurgeon, what sort of spine diseases or disorders are managed by neurosurgeons? Um, in, in, oh, again, in, in for, for uh, neurosurgery, we, we have people who are, who are sub-specializing in pediatric neurosurgery, and you have the ones who are, uh, who are just doing general and spine surgery. So in, in the ones who are doing pediatric neurosurgery, what they come, they operate, and they come across are patients who have spinal defects, actually. Mm -hmm. So they, these are the patients who are born with, um, with congenital spine defects, and the spine could, they could, uh, maybe have an abnormal, low abnormal skin, and just uh, the spinal cord may be just open. Right. Uh, and, and as such, the patient, the doctor, the neurosurgeon has to repair and uh, this defect. And uh, as, as you move up in, in, into the age age group, then you come across patients with trauma. Uh, so you have people who have uh, from road traffic accidents who have fractures of the spine, mm -hmm. and that uh, would require um, the compression to alleviate the problems because. When they have a fracture of the spine, it may compress on the spinal cord. So you have to make sure that the spinal cord is is good, is not compressed, and you have to stabilize the bone because of the fracture. And further, and sometimes, even if there is no no trauma, patients develop discus hernia. Mm -hmm. So when that's when the disc uh, comes out from the um, uh, from the from this normal alignment right. and it com and compresses on the spinal roots. So in such cases, the neurosurgeons would have to remove the, uh, the, 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 spine, the, the disc. And normally these operations were done, are done under microscope or it could be even be done under, under endoscopic techniques. And later on, uh, in the older age group, sometimes you have uh, even tumors of the, of the spinal cord um, and you have um, degeneration of the, of, the, of the bones and uh, leading to spinal stenosis, which re you require decompression so that because as, as, as you get older, sometimes the, the, the canal of the spinal, of the spinal cord uh, of gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So as such, you have to make, uh, give space for the spinal, spinal canal to... Right. Yeah. I think one of the bigger problems for a neurosurgeon would be an infected nervous system. Uh, w would that be a big problem? When, when you set out to do a surgery, you find out there's an infection, uh, what happens then? Yeah, infection, is, we have to be very meticulous actually. Um, I think n most neurosurgeons, uh, they have uh, some mild form of obsess obsessive compulsive disorder, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you have OCD? <laughs> <laughs> <Not> so. <laughs> and I think we are very uh, particular and meticulous in, uh, in the um, at the sterility of the of the field or what we're, what we're operating so uh, everything we have to be we re-sterilize uh, and make the pay that make the operation site very aseptic mm -hmm. yeah. now uh, dr. Liu coming back to you 
Uh, let's talk about those with seizures or epilepsy. Can they be treated by a neuro neurosurgeon? Yeah, definitely neurosurgery have a huge uh, role and responsibility in treating a patient with epilepsy, especially those with a focal uh, epileptogenic uh, lesion in the brain or which uh, causing a refractory form of uh, epilepsy. What I mean by refractory means is, is the condition or the seizure cannot be controlled by medication per se. Mm -hmm. and to, to carry out this task, we actually need to do a, a quite a thorough investigation to look at the zone that causes seizure. And this usually in a younger age group, in, in a, a teenager uh, with a late presentation of seizure. And those investigations will be able to let us pinpoint the, the seizure uh, point, the focus that causing seizure. And we can treat by surgical means, uh, by resecting uh, area that is causing seizure, or sometimes we can do a disconnection uh, between different fibers that causing seizure in a patient. The, the other form of treatment, we can even go uh, to put a stimulator, uh, we call it stimu uh, vaginal stimulation, in, in controlling the seizure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we've discussed quite a bit uh, in this uh, couple of segments that we have. Uh, when you look at neurosurgery, are there any rarities in patients that a neurosurgeon would treat? Uh, in Malaysia, in Malaysia the, the, uh, the, what we commonly treat, uh, uh, of course, we have the trauma, but we also have a lot of strokes. Mm -hmm. So the strokes that we come across uh, here, are mostly due to the infarcts, where there's lack of blood going to the brain. So this part of the brain sometimes um, uh, gets uh, gets uh, have no 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 oxygenation to the brain. So what what happens is that they become they have become, they have swell from a comp they have a kind of, kind of swelling. Mm -hmm. So it may require a neurosurgeon's advice and a treatment to re relieve the the the. There's the stressed area yes. which is, uh, yes. is swollen, yeah. and sometimes you need to revascularize the the blood blood vessels to establish uh, a, right. a new vasculature for the brain. Speaking of revascularization, uh, how successful is it these days? Uh, they, it's freak, uh, most of the time it's been done a lot in Jap in Japan mm -hmm. and in Korea because uh, some diseases are more prevalent there in Japan and Korea and I think it's quite the the results have been quite good actually mm -hmm. because we have new technology to assist and there's new uh, techniques microscopes and microsurgical techniques right. which helps to improve the outcome of the outcome of the operation mm -hmm. now that we we've, we've talked about the nitty-gritty of what a uh, neurosurgeon does some very simple questions uh, in the next uh, couple of remaining minutes with regards to uh, experience. Does an experienced neurosurgeon make a difference? You know, when you start off as a neurosurgeon and as you move on, uh, does experience make your work better? Yes, I think I've, I've started neurosurgery in 1988 mm -hmm. and um, at that, uh, when I was young, I used to be very edgy in the operation theater. I used to be very stressed out. So I, I expect everything to be very, uh, very uh, perfect. proper, proper and perfect. perfect, yeah. Because of your OCD. <laughs> yes. And I think and when I, as I grow up, um, uh, when you get older, um, because I have to teach and, and uh, we, have, we have to teach the nurses and the, the, the neurosurgeons and the master students and, and the tra our trainees. So I think we, become, we, we tend to be, be a bit more calm and we, because we know if they have a complication in operation, we know what to expect and we know how to handle it. Because when we're young, we, sometimes we get stressed out. We don't know how to handle this. But when, as you grow older, you become more confident and I think you, um, you realize that sometimes even in, in operation, it's not. It's not depend. It does not depend completely on on your capability or your experience. It depends a lot on God as well. Right. right. I think God makes the executive Do, decision. Doctor Liu, would you would you uh, agree with what he's saying? Yeah, definitely agree. And mm -hmm. uh, one important point that we need to understand is, uh, even a patient presented with the same diseases, uh, but the the flow of the treatment, even surgical treatment, may be differ from one patient to the others. And a lot of times that what we learn uh, from the textbook is something a common man could have. But in, in reality, there's uh, so many variations 
uh, intraoperatively in each individual patient, and that makes uh, experience an important factor uh, in the training in the practice of neurosurgery. Right. Yeah. So uh, the difference in individuality can make so much of a difference within these the surgery. Yes, right? definitely. Yep. On that note, we'd like to thank uh, both of you, uh, Dr. Dr. Azmin Kasrosman and Dr. Liu Boon Singh, consultant uh, neurosurgeons from Ramsey Syme Dabi Healthcare, joining us right here on Medical Today, giving us an insight as to what they do professionally, which is neurosurgery. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Garrett. Stay with us. We're going to take a short break and come back with more for you on today's edition of Medical Today, right here on BNC. Hello and welcome back to the final segment of Medical Today. Now, uh, what we're going to talk about involves a lot of pronunciation work. So we're going to look at something called oculoplastics. Now, what is that all about? To tell us more about that area of speciality, we have Dr. Nazila Binti Ahmad Azli. She's a consultant ophthalmologist and oculoplastic lacrimal and orbital surgeon from Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare. That was a mouthful, but we'll find out what it is. Doc, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for taking time off your busy schedule to be with us. Now, it, just to give us an overview of what oculoplastics are, can you walk us through what this is? Thank you for having me here. Well, oculoplastic surgery is uh, one of the uh, subspecialties uh, in the field of uh, ophthalmology. Uh, it basically deals with the um, uh, plastic, reconstructive and aesthetic uh, surgery of the eyelid, okay, the tear system or the lacrimal system, the uh, orbit or the eye socket, the upper face and also the mid face. Uh, so what kind, of, what, what kind of patients do you see or what are the common cases do you see okay. in your area yeah. or subspeciality? Well, when we talk about oculoplastic surgery, uh, I, I suppose the main bulk of our work uh, would be the eyelid. Okay, so the eyelid cases um, comprise about uh, 75 to 80 percent of uh, the whole uh, uh, workload and uh, followed by the crimal uh, system diseases um, that would account for probably 10 to 15 percent and the least would be uh, the orbital cases. Right, so w what kind of eyelid problems would mm. be referred to you? Okay. Now, who does the referral work? Mm, okay. Uh, the, the eyelid cases uh, that uh, uh, oculoplastic surgeons deal with, okay, uh, there is a wide variety uh, of uh, eyelid cases. Uh, we deal with uh, uh, all, age, all age group, okay, the pediatric uh, age group and also uh, the adult population. Um, I would say the common cases would be 
things like um, uh, eyelid uh, uh, malposition. Okay, they come to you with uh, probably um, eyelid uh, disorders like uh, ptosis. Uh, ptosis is actually a condition whereby there's droopy eyelid. Okay, it can happen in uh, pediatric age group since birth, uh, and it can also happen in the adult population due to various causes. And um, other than that, a patient may come to you with uh, uh, problems like uh, in turning, you know, outward turning of uh, the eyelid. So okay, mm -hmm. we call it uh, ectropion or interning, uh, uh, interning uh, uh, eyelid. eyelid. Okay, we call entropion and um, uh, loose skin or redundant skin of the upper eyelid or lower eyelids, or the better known as uh, eye bags. Okay, and um, it for the pediatric age group, um, they can also present with uh, lid uh, abnormalities such as failure of fusion of the eyelids, uh, we call coloboma. And uh, it's also uh, common to have uh, ptosis uh, since birth. Okay. And uh, apart from that, uh, eyelid conditions would be that of uh, infection, uh, inflammation, uh, eyelid tumours such as uh, uh, the benign growth of, of the eyelids and also uh, malignant cases and uh, not forgetting eyelid trauma okay, right. from various uh, causes. With, with the bulk of patients you see where, mm -hmm. where in all the different and all the different types of uh, surgeries you do, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the most commonest in Malaysia? Um, you mean in terms of surgery? In terms of surgery. The commonest, um, I would say um, well, I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, eyelid basically. Okay, it let's break it down a little mm. bit more. Let's bring it down to children. When, when you see mm. children, what mm -hmm. are the common problems with uh, Malaysian children? Ptosis. Ptosis. Droopy lids. Right. Mm. So the, the, these are droopy lids. Mm. And, and how do you fix them? Okay, um, droopy lids in children, uh, they are normally, um, uh, the, the cause is usually due to the uh, maldevelopment of the uh, levator muscles or the muscle that is responsible uh, to see, to, to open up okay, the, the eyelid retractors. So the, um, when there is um, maldevelopment, the, the function is usually uh, very poor. So uh, what we need to do, we need to rectify this problem by doing surgery to actually suspend the brow, okay, or frontally sling, we call it. Uh, whereby we use uh, synthetic materials or we can also harvest uh, fasciolata from the thigh mm -hmm. uh, to become the material to, to uh, uh, bring up the, the lid so that you know, um, children can, can have a better view um, and, and to prevent further complications. So essentially with droopy eyelids, what's happening? Okay, um, with droopy eyelids, okay, uh, it can cause blurring of vision. Mm -hmm. okay? Um, in children, it's very important because uh, we have this critical age period whereby there shouldn't be any obstruction to the vision. Okay? So when there is droopy eyelids, they tend to, uh, it, it, can, it can either totally obstruct the vision or it can uh, obstruct the vision partially. All right? So when they obstruct the vision partially, the eyelid can cause um, a glare or astigmatism. And uh, when this happens, uh, it's like having a refractive error. Okay, so when this happens, um, the, the affected uh, eye will become uh, lazy if not treated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Now, uh, with droopy eyelids, uh, mm -hmm. I understand that adults have droopy eyelids too. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with uh, children and adults having uh, droopy eyelids, is the problem different when, when it comes to treating it or, or helping the person? Yeah, yeah, it's very important to distinguish between these two because the management is totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, adults, normally the, the levator function, the, mus the function of the muscle is good. Okay, so we don't actually need uh, to use synthetic material mm -hmm. or to, to uh, use uh, fasciolata from the thigh to fix the problem, but uh, the, 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 the surgery would normally, um, uh, would normally be that of uh, tightening the muscles right. rather than, rather <coughs> than uh, fixing it with uh, synthetic materials. Now, th there's other problems uh, that uh, you also handled, which is a lacrimal or tear system. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about how, how uh, 
what you do to help people with problems okay. with the NGO system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, we need to establish the diagnosis by doing um, simple um, uh, tests uh, in the clinic, apart from the clinical examination. So, um, if at all, I mean, the usual cases would be that of uh, nasal cranial duct obstruction or tear duct obstruction, and um, if patient um, anatomically or has this kind of problem, surgery would be the only uh, uh, treatment. Right. Yeah. And uh, if let's say, so when uh, you said as a result, if a patient is is anatomically having mm. this problem, mm. uh, which means that there, there's something wrong with the system. Yes. Right. There is usually an obstruction, mm -hmm. narrowing um, or a stricture mm -hmm. um, that's causing tears to flow um, freely. Um, um, from the eye to the nose and to the throat. Okay, so uh, if this happens, then of course surgery, surgery is the, is the answer to it. Mm -hmm. But um, before uh, uh, embarking on the surgery, um, these people, these patients, they normally come with um, recurring infections. So when there is recurring infections, they need to be treated with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So you treat them with mm -hmm. antibiotics first, mm -hmm. deal with the infections, yeah. and then work on surgery. Yeah, but not everybody would have this kind of uh, infection, even though they have nasal crime or drug obstruction, depending on the degree of the obstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, right. From there, uh, just one or two more questions with regards to the eye. Now we're going to talk about um, cases or problems that can affect the orbit or eye socket. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you walk us through these problems that, that we have yeah. with regards to uh, the orbit or the eye socket? Okay, um, the orbit or the eye socket is actually um, the bony walls okay, that encase the, the, the globe, the eyeball, the muscles, uh, the fat you know, that's surrounding the, the, the muscles. So there are many uh, pathologies that can arise from, from, uh, uh, from the orbit. Um, the common would be uh, inflammation common ones, uh, mm -hmm. inflammation, orbital in infection, okay, like orbital cellulitis, uh, orbital tumour can also arise from the orbit and it can be um, either benign or malignant and, um, and if you happen to have um, surgeries, uh, sorry, um, if you happen to have uh, um, fractures of the, of the face, okay, facial area, um, most of the time uh, the orbit uh, will be involved as well. Right. So uh, when there is orbital fractures, so we deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, so m mo most 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 always, mm -hmm. they usually trauma patients that come in um, with these problems. Yeah. When, when there are fractures involved. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I do understand that uh, in your area of speciality, there's an offer for patients who are blind or have deformed eyes. What can be done okay. to help? Uh, these people. Okay, yeah. Um, normally for these people, um, there are two categories. Okay, one uh, would be those blind and deformed eye. The other one would be that of uh, having painful blind eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in order to, to alleviate this problem, um, what we normally offer is that uh, we would remove surgically the intraocular content or the eye eyeball content um, of the patient and we replace it with an orbital implant, synthetic from synthetic material, uh, to replace the volume. And um, the outer coating of the eye, okay, uh, the eyeball we should call sclera, mm -hmm. is uh, modified um, to cover up the orbital implant. Right. And after six weeks of surgery, we would normally put an uh, ocular uh, prosthesis or artificial eye. Mm -hmm. And it, this is usually, made, uh, uh, usually custom made Okay, you can customize it according right. to the fellow eye, mm -hmm. and patient will look perfect after that. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, of course, Dr. Nazila, it's been a pleasure having you in the studio uh, mm -hmm. to walk us through or give us an overview as to what ocular plastics are right here on a Medical Today. If you do have any questions for all the professionals that we had on board uh, on this episode, all you need to do is send us an email, send it to ASK or ask at medicaltoday.my furnish us with your question, we're going to send you the answers, but we'll also do you one better, we'll send you a bottle of vitamins courtesy of Pharma Nyaga. On that note, on behalf of the Medical Today team, I'm Jared Rutnam signing off. You have a great weekend and a fantastic week ahead. Thank you very much, Doc. It was a pleasure having Thank you. Thank you.